Hello and namaste. As always, I humbly thank you for tuning in to listen to me ramble at you via the interwebs. I am your host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Fear. Why fighting it fails. I chose that title because, in all honesty, I live in fear. And if we all paused and were very honest with each other, odds are most of us would identify something in the context of our lives or our surroundings that we live in fear of. Odds are more than one, perhaps many, unfortunately. In today's environment, there are many things to be feared. Here's what triggered me. I experience anxiety and fear whenever I approach the microphone, and I'm using bunny ear air quotes for microphone or a round microphone, because I'm not in a studio and I don't have a fancy microphone in front of me. But um, <clears throat> I have to, on a daily basis, or at least the almost daily basis when I sit with the intention to record an episode, I must confront this anxiety and fear that wells up inside of me. And I'm not trying to play the sympathy card. I'm not, not trying to, you know, be a woe is, be in a woe is me situation. And I'm not trying to, uh, disclaimers and disclaimers aside. I think the thing that upsets me the most or that troubles me the most, challenges me the most, is that I have a very hard time coming up with catchy titles. And that's a banal problem to have. Truly a first world issue, a first world concern. But, you know, media is media. And you got to draw the audience in one way or the other. In fact... Just this past weekend, I took a moment to scroll through my homepage that hosts the podcast to check out the numbers per episode. And it's interesting. There's just a weird distribution. Uh, let's t pause here a moment. Huzzah, dear listeners. A couple of episodes have hit over 100 downloads, plus whatever number of plays on the website. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, please keep listening and, uh, hopefully a larger, with more and more people tuning in to the show, uh, we'll start to get a nice flow of comments. I'm always open to read and respond to people's comments, questions, suggestions. Uh, I just have a very low tolerance for hate speech and pointless name-calling. I digress. This is an easy fear to cope with, this fear of facing the microphone, facing the small yet apparently growing audience that seems to be downloading these episodes that I share. And it's intimidating, quite frankly. And I'm a confident person. I'm a person who grew up uh, always sort of an extrovert introvert. I don't know. There's some people have coined a, a combination of those two terms. I don't remember if I'm, I don't think just the two back to back is it, but um, I've always 
an outgoing introvert. Uh, and uh, I was also, you know, I brought up with theater background because of circumstance and interest. Uh, so while performative acts don't intimidate me intellectually, I still, in a good way, uh, when in a theater space with an audience, I still get energy, you know? I still get, not the nerves, but this upwelling of excitement and energy and enthusiasm and focus. Something different with this format, A, because there aren't people in a room. I'd love to do this show in front of a live studio audience and do it in like a regional theater, a touring regional theater show. That would be awesome. Let's rally and build an audience on the internet so that I can just call up the theaters and be like, hey, I've got audience everywhere. Book me in a such and such regional theater in your town and boom, we can book a tour a couple years out. Put a pin in that, friends. Let's get back to fear though. Sorry. Obviously it's late. In uh, at, it's 11.52 my time. Um, and, uh, yeah, even just now, as I sat to prepare to record this episode, I felt that interesting variety of anxiety and fear of, you know, what if I just ramble like an idiot and no one cares and people stop listening? Now that's a silly fear. Obviously, fear is one word that encompasses a lot of different things. And at the grandest scale, it must be noted, it must be observed, and I think contemplated deeply by all those capable of observing and contemplating deeply, that our species lives in a hyperactive, fear-inducing system one quickly comes to wonder, after surveying postmodern society and its machinations, if fear is not a desired goal. Obviously, there's conspiracy theories out there that insist that it is. I'm splitting the difference theoretically, because I don't want to assert that I have um, concrete knowledge about any given conspiracy theory. What I do know is that some fear tactics are patently obvious and evident. One I like to call out whenever people are sort of manifesting it themselves is the fear gun profiteering cycle. Somebody goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and, um, as a friend of mine likes to say, and, uh, and you know, go somewhere with a stockpile of guns, usually, in, and tragically, legally acquired without any need for it to have been acquired illegally, which you know makes the problem even harder to get any consensus on how to address it, but I digress. Immediately after such shooting events, what happens? Something that every once in a while gets commented on but doesn't ever really get investigated and, you know, no one's done an expose that I'm aware of. But it's out there. It's out there hiding in plain sight. But after every event that can after every event that involved uh, an active shooter, as it were, uh, gun sales tend to pick up. Some might even say or observe that there's been some really big spikes. Now, let's not go down that rabbit hole, but put simply, I mean, the cynical view is that the gun industry is profiteering and on these this fear that we all have and using fear tactics, fear-mongering tactics in their marketing. Uh, and it 
gets expressed in our shopping pattern. Why do we fight fear? Well, what is fear? Let's start there. Let's back up a little bit. What is fear? Fear is an emotion. Fear is a reaction. Fear is a state of mind. Fear is a frequency. Fear is an energetic bandwidth. It's all those things. Fear is an electrical chemical process in the brain. It is uh, a multifaceted, very palpable, very in, you know, powerful and impacting emotion or emotional wave or emotional ride. It's many things all bundled into this one word. And there's many, it takes many forms when we feel it. Obviously, the fear that I feel when I stare at the big red button that's waiting for me to start the live broadcast slash recording of each podcast episode is radically different than other people's fear given different contexts. And I'm not trying to claim anything, but what I am suggesting, dear friends, and what I am inviting everyone out there listening now or in the future to consider is that we we are encouraged by our societal systems to take an antagonistic viewpoint on fear. We fight everything. Everything's a fight in this postmodern Western world. We gotta fight our politics, we gotta fight for social change, we gotta fight for our rights, we gotta fight for our freedom, we gotta fight for our lives. We gotta fight, fight, fight. So we feel fear. Like a lot of things about the human species, we've taken something that was once healthy and natural. Fear was, in evolutionary sense, very helpful because it made sure that we would become increasingly alert and ready to fight or run away, etc. And that's why I fear, in many ways, often is reported as making one feel alive. That's why in this postmodern context, we have to develop this sort of thrill-seeking addiction, this adrenaline junkie identity. We've displaced fear. Lions aren't hunting us in the savannas. Other creatures don't threaten our lives or predate on us. No one's trying to eat us. Now we just fear each other. Because we removed ourselves from the food chain, we left a vacuum. We left ourselves with very little else to fear but ourselves and each other. And increasingly now, Mother Nature at large. But we approach everything, and have for a very long time, with this antagonistic mechanism at the core of everything. We look at nature as something to overcome, something to tear apart in order to reconstitute, commodify, and profit on. Very unhealthy relationship to have with the womb that is nurturing us towards our greater birth. Tune in for past and future episodes for more on that. Well, friends, Akin to my argument or thesis about ego and how we ought better be relating to it than the current common wisdom might indicate, we can't really fight our fears. We can face them and then either live through that which we fear and 
there's a wide range of outcomes to that. S some might get numbed and normalized to that which would they fear and then start perpetuating, projecting, manifesting that which they fear. That's not necessarily the healthiest outcome, is it? We can also face what we fear and run away from it, but then what? We have to face it again. What? Run away from it again. We can face what we fear and destroy it. But if what we fear is more often than not ourselves or each other or nature, that again doesn't sound like a particularly healthy choice or desired outcome. Well, friends, what's left? If I may humbly suggest, the one thing we are passively and actively distracted and deterred from considering healing. We can face our fears and then heal them, thus healing ourselves. And, naturally by extension, with continued practice, healing each other. Now, some might say that's a cop-out. It's easy to just say, heal yourself. I understand it's hard work, and we have no mainstream guidance. We have some attempts. I don't mean to dismiss the various waves of writings and other publications and products out there that do address this very issue. I'm not saying that there is zero information out there. I just mean that at the core of our mainstream everyday systems, it's obviously not at the central pillar or spotlight of society. It's something that we have to kind of stumble across in the alternative section of the bookstore. And yet, ironically, the founders of all three major religions, historically, spoke of divine healing and how it is every human being's birthright as the children of God. Not the very notion that this particular group is better than that particular group and selected above and beyond all other human beings. That's an intrusion. Intrusion? Incursion, that's the word I meant to say, that's an incursion of ego corruption into the attempt to preserve the teachings of those wise, arguably enlightened individuals that might have achieved some awareness above and beyond the typical or average conditioned awareness that we're used to walking around in, in our society. As I ramble about in some other episodes, I'm sure already, and will probably return to in future episodes, I'd like to say that this problem is not the result of anything going on right now in our postmodern context. This shit is ancient. This shit is also very meta, as I was trying to express to some friends on social media the other day. This is bigger than any particular political agenda or movement or group or any corrupt individuals or families or conspiracies operating in the shadows behind political parties or groups or governments. This is deeper and bigger than that. I humbly suggest to you folks that indeed it spans into aspects of the universe that we are generally discouraged from contemplating or even understanding exist. That's why it's important for us not only to become aware that we're being encouraged to use all the wrong tools, but become self-aware enough to forge for ourselves a new path that redirects us towards using the appropriate spiritual tools for the goals we really want to achieve. 
It sounds like a dumb question to ask, but which team are you on? Endless war profiteering, profiteering society, debt slavery, destruction of Mother Earth team? Or healing, love, compassion, forgiveness, transformation, evolution, living in harmony with nature team? Now, we are conditioned to hate the hippies. We are conditioned to dismiss the mystics. We are conditioned throughout society, throughout all cultural variations, to ridicule, marginalize, and sort of at a knee-jerk level, dismiss out of hand without much serious thought anyone who comes to us with the same exact message that Jesus said or brought to us in his era. The same exact message that Buddha brought. Mind you, I'm not talking about the red words in the red line New Age version edition 75 or whatever. However many new fangled. And I don't mean to dismiss or you know disrespect people who are very attached to that version of the story. All I want to share with you is, and I encourage everyone to acknowledge as a fact, I'm not spreading propaganda here, this is a fact, the, these editions of the Bible that exist are part of a lineage of an ongoing agenda to edit them and parse them away from whatever was originally taught, and that arguably this is a very important aspect or a feature of the agenda of those who have hijacked most major organized religions. Now, my evidence for that is painfully obvious. Just take a quick look around the world and see how many people are killing other people in the name of their God, or in the quote-unquote self-defense of their religion. Meanwhile, read the original language, earliest written accounts of what all all of which were you know all the major religions barring in theory according to what i've read um islam but i, I could be incorrect about this or oral traditions first so who is anyone keeping the oral traditions alive the original oral traditions alive and how much can we count on them and their supposed safeguards against telephone effect you know, the telephone effect. You get 75 people in a line, you say one sentence to the fir first person in that line, and then you walk to the end of the line and you wait with earplugs in until the person at the end of the line has been told in, by the person next to them that sentence, and you take your earplugs out and listen to that sentence. It's a completely different sentence. Right? It changes. Now, in theory, according to those who were proponents of the ancient traditions of oral history of oral spiritual traditions of oral practices these were ancient traditions in which there were inherent um practical safeguards against variant variations and and uh, you know disambiguations away from <clears throat> the original quote-unquote text even though at the time you know we're talking about oral traditions they weren't texts right But go back to the oldest text versions and get really good translations of those. And it's really clear and obvious. Compare English translations of the oldest available biblical texts. And then look at anything after King James. And it's radically different. And keeps getting more different in subtle, small really easy to sort of rationalize away and or not even give a shit about ways. But I digress. When you dig around, as I have, you find that ancient mystics throughout time from all cultures have often addressed in their own way, in language that made sense at the time, and using the spiritual practices as they understood them in their culture and their context at addressing 
healing of these spiritual traumas that living life in the world as we see it and understand it cause. Because even in the days of Jesus or in the days of the people just like Jesus, for because there's a long list of names of people who got up and said, whoa, hey folks, I don't think we're doing this whole society thing right. Maybe we should focus a little less on making money and a little more on taking care of each other, healing each other, uh, providing for one another, lifting each other up, and uh, maybe we should tune in to these spiritual frequencies because there seems to be some good messages there about what we could focus on and some work we could be doing in that department, to paraphrase and to put into postmodern terminology. You know, but there's a common chorus of voices from ancient times urging us deeply to look within, to heal ourselves and each other of the trauma that we experience. Because even in ancient times, life on this earth and the society that we built was traumatic. It's ever so more important now to reevaluate these ancient messages especially as evidence piles on about the convergence of some of these observations made by ancient mystics and spiritualists, etc., uh, about the internal realm that they claim to be able to access through spiritual practices, and how that seems to be converging with how quantum physics and some of these other cutting-edge sciences that look at this microscopic and the minute and the invisible in our universe. Uh, these, de these descriptions coming from two different camps seem to find places where they harmonize and converge and seem to be describing the same phenomena in different ways. The simplest example of this is fractalism or the fractal nature of reality. Fractal is a very postmodern term. The person who invented it is still alive. Uh, Mr. Mandelbro, a mathematician, I forget what country he's from, uh, but obviously he coined uh, the term, and it's quite simple enough to find and confirm. I'm not making things up. It's because a real guy, and he's got a lot to say about fractals and about what the mathematics accurately describes about reality. And it can be summarized in simple sentences like this. All of reality and its constituent components are fractals. And now, you'd have to dig into what a fractal is and some of the more interesting and curious aspects of the way it functions for that to be a really profoundly interesting statement. But nevertheless... What's fascinating is that ancient mystics concur and often use fractal art. Even long before the term fractal was coined, the phenomena of fractalism, fractal, uh, fractal unfoldings are constantly occurring. Fractal geometry is self-evident around us in nature everywhere, and it's self-confirming. Now, one of the larger implications of a fractal perspective on reality is that all components of the fractal are interconnected and intraconnected. In other words, they're holograms. So the smallest part of the whole image contains enough information to describe the whole image, and any part of the whole image in some way or another, reflects and contains within it a description or a reflection or a, a fractal um, re-representation of the whole image. Ancient artists express this by using geometric shapes. Uh, philosophers described 
ancient sacred geometry pretty early on. Mathematics and physics confirm that those geometries are indeed embedded everywhere in reality. Why? Did someone engineer reality, or can a living system be itself a fractal, an expression of these mathematic abstractions? Because, not because, but can, a, can mathematics itself be an aspect of life? Ancient mystics agree the answer is yes. Ancient mystics told us a long time ago that reality is life, and life is reality. They may have used radically different words, poetic, symbolism, etc. I'm expressing my opinion in my own words, right? But I encourage everyone to not just take my word for it, but to go and read some of these beautiful words as preserved uh, by historians and scholars from around the world and get into it for yourself. And more interestingly, more powerfully, I humbly suggest, work with the actual living practices we may not have a mainstream pop cultural um, tradition of empowering people to heal themselves, but those kinds of ideas and that kind of language always crops up and is always welling up from people who discover it for themselves. Why? Because it is our birthright as children of God. It is everyone's birthright as children of God. It is every life form's birthright as children of God, and everything in the universe is a life form, which is some form of a child of God. The catch is, particularly for humans, here in this particular time frame especially, but across most time frames, mind you, and tune into other episodes for a deeper discussion down that rabbit hole about probability waveform function time frames for species. There's countless number of them. And the biggest thing that humanity has in common with itself across all of these time frames is this ridiculous self-destructive obsession with playing the ego game or the ego experiment seeing how long we can beat ourselves up in the meat grinder merry-go-round of life and death and suffering in between. For what? For profit. Because profit's fun. And gives you power here in this material realm. Now that power is meaningless and absolutely useless in the very next classroom that we need to graduate into. I, I, it's not another dimension. It's a feature of this dimension that we're in, there's generally, roughly speaking, from what I understand, three big classrooms. Each of them have a subset of quizzes, let's say, challenges, tests. The one we're in is like kinder care. And if my survey of ancient traditions, concurs with other people's investigation into ancient traditions, the key ingredients to getting through this current situation that we're in is transformative healing and radical spiritual evolution, which cannot be activated. This radical spiritual evolution is a process that is, again, an organic birthright to the human species and to all forms of life. 
you just have to get your way there. You have to you have to develop your way to it, and you have to pass certain tests. And one of them is this test, this ego test. The false solution to this ego test is, quote, killing the ego, which sets you up to fight your ego, which sets you up to take on a combative position against everything, even the good things in your life. And I humbly suggest to you, dear friends, listening now and or in the future, this is sort of a catch-22 ego trap mindfuck of a solution. I don't think it gets us all the way there. I think some people might have some profound experiences approaching their ego with that kind of antagonistic stance, but ultimately the lesson, I think, I personally, I understand I could be wrong, but I invite everyone to consider this. I think that the test ultimately is can you heal your ego and reintegrate with it? Your ego is your shadow self. And your soul is your light being self. The two are mutually arising, intraconnected, kind of like Peter Pan and his shadow where they play that game where he runs away and leaves his shadow behind, and Wendy, you know, tries to, you know, finds it and tries to stitch it back onto him. That's an illusion that Peter Pan creates, right? Well, we've created this illusion that we are something separate from our ego and our higher self, our light being self. We've come up with these confusing terms and then we've externalized and personified both of them, called them God and Satan. It's all a big mess. And it's easy to lose track of what might actually be the most effective solution to this whole big mess. And not sound like a broken records, friends, but I, every night, that's why do this silly project. Every night, I humbly sit to meditate and pray. I think the two must be done in conjunction with each other, not because I say so, but because they're naturally and organically interrelated. They are each other's yin and yang. We must pray earnest and sincere prayers, not to some imaginary externalized God out there that's going to judge and determine which one of us deserves to have our prayers answered by it, him or her, that's not how it actually works. That's a misrepresentation that we've tricked ourselves into becoming way more mainstream than the truth, the reality of what actually is. When we pray, we do indeed send our request and our share. We share our intentions, our hopes, our aspirations, and our energies with the living womb that we call the universe. That is the totality of the whole thing that's giving birth to us. It is us. So ultimately, we're praying to ourselves. And meditation is the flip side of that. It is the sincere abdication of our personal, ego-driven personality jibber-jabber box into silence so that we may genuinely and honestly and sincerely receive wisdom and understanding and healing and inspiration from that which is the divine mind out there being everything, the unity of consciousness at the core of all that is manifest, right? For what is that which we call God, if not that, it certainly isn't some old dude with a beard sitting in some special kingdom that floats in the sky or in some place that we can't see that's going to judge us and send us to one or the other extreme as a reward or a punishment because, quite frankly, that doesn't, that doesn't fit with fractal reality. And that's, in my humble opinion, the simplest way 
to stop wasting time arguing about ideas about nature and reality and what may or may not happen in the future or in the afterlife or in this present moment as we live through it according to what beliefs we cling to. Instead of arguing over the ideology, why aren't we tuning into this beautiful, epic, magnificent, mind-blowing, living hologram that is alive and is the womb that nurtures us? Perhaps the answer to why we have been, up until recently, willingly neglecting that communion, that connection, that that communication with reality, that form of connecting to that which gives us life, life itself, all caps, life. We've been neglecting that relationship because when we live in fear, when we live in neglect of that relationship, when we live in a systemic society full of corruption and abuse, then that corruption and abuse and profiteering is easier to get away with because people are really buried under all that fear and suffering and dis-ease and discomfort that is generated from the simple fact that we are not connected to our mother and our father, our spiritual cosmic mother and father, that we are not connected to our universal family, that we're not connected to the divinity, that which we labeled God. And that, that, my friends, I think is really, truly deep down there at the root source of most of the world's problems. So instead of voting for one of the solutions that is designed to keep us running around on this meat grinder merry-go-round of self-destruction, why don't we choose for the solutions that actually involve the practices and tools that are outside of that? For you can never solve a problem by the using the tools that built it. You must use radically different tools, right? Healing and forgiveness are radically different tools than all those which we are encouraged to use. In fact, healing and forgiveness are actively and maliciously and surreptitiously, covertly targeted as things that must be rejected. I mean, the biggest irony of religious uh people who 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 act out from within their organized religions is that they're obviously and critically uh obviously and um what's the word i'm trying to say never mind they're clearly and obviously acting in a hypocritic way like in a, hip, in a way that is a hypocrisy to the core teachings of the organized religion to which they belong right they haven't managed to actually turn Jesus into a gun-toting redneck in the Bible just yet. But, I mean, the bumper stickers are out there, folks. The image is there. They're, they're ready and waiting. They're, they've been coaxing people towards this radically unfactual representation of the enlightened person that we call Christos. And distracting people away from the real valuable wealth of wisdom, teachings, and practices that that individual probably shared with us, or whoever that individual, that symbol for that individual actually was. That's a whole other rabbit hole. Was William Shakespeare one person or four lesbians pretending to be one man as they collaborated with the, you know, hoity-toity members of that particular theater? etc., right? Uh, we can go chasing conspiracy theories. Or we can just start reconnecting ourselves to reality as it actually is. And that requires us to abandon not only conspiracy theory, no offense, conspiracy theorists, I'm not judging any conspiracy theory as an individual. 
uh, I'm not judging any person who is attached to conspiracy theories as an individual. Earlier, I meant to say, I'm not judging any conspiracy theorist, and I missed the T. I didn't do my elocution warm-ups before the show today. I think I'm making my point clearly enough. Yes? No? What do you guys think, dear audience? I know I've certainly rambled on for quite enough time. I'm going to humbly thank you for tuning in, encourage you to invent your own. The revolution truly is deep within, my friends. And while there are many well-established practices out there, at its core, the revolution is organic and does not need a school of thought. It needs your willing participation in the simple and silent investigation of your internal world without prejudices and without blinders on. Right? You can do it by doing yoga. Yoga's great. You can do it through martial arts. You can just go jog up a mountain and have an epiphany or three. Ultimately, no matter what school of thought, no matter what form of practice, it boils down to a few core ingredients. Looking inward, welcoming silence, not controlling your mind, but welcoming in silence and allowing it to blossom. And then forgiveness and healing and love as a means to soothe your mind, which will attempt to disrupt your silence, right? That's the big thing everyone always says. Oh, I can't meditate because my brain rambles too much. I can't turn off my brain. Don't try to turn off your brain. Confront the thoughts it spews at you. Confront them, not with fighting, because that will often fail. Why? Because it's designed to. It gets you nothing. If you fight your fear, well, you can't really kill it. it I mean, you can't... Unless, it's, unless what you're fearing is a, a physical, real-life threat upon your life. If that's obvious and a category that I'm... A, a, a very specific category of fear that I'm not addressing. I'm talking about, you know, this postmodern fear we live, this fear of other, this fear of self, this fear of insert your favorite political, ideological fear target. We live in fear of a lot of things, and often we're kind of sort of not really self-aware of them. And it takes a bit of effort to catch ourselves and go, oh, well, that's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm actually afraid of. You need to ask the universe, hey, universe, reveal myself to me. And with enough effort and honest abdication, honest just simply letting go of the con the the conditioning, the programming, the preconceived thoughts, the notion, just everything, right? The whole process. I was trying to wrap up, and I started a whole nother jag. I'm not going to go for another forty five minutes. Thank you, my friends, for tuning in. I hope that as you explore, I mean, do the research. I'm not here to preach to anybody what they should believe. I'm here to remind folks that there are sources out there that connect and that have synergy and that make sense and that you can go explore for yourself. And that ultimately, what the, one of the strongest things these all have in common is that ultimately all they're going to do is point you to yourself and inward. No matter what author, no matter what practice, if it's genuine and true and is being expressed by someone who has had a genuine and true epiphany or enlightenment or a you know phase of awakening or uh, mind you, there's this ego trap there because everyone can easily start getting caught up in self congratulatory ego inflation, right? Like, oh, I'm so cool now that I've awakened to stuff. Uh, but that's a whole nother episode. But any true expression of it is free of mandates 
It's free of demanding your blind faith. It's free. It, it lacks any of that. The moment that you find those ingredients in it, then that's something that's been processed by a system put out there by the hijackers of human systems for profit. As soon as it becomes confrontational, as soon as it becomes us versus them, as soon as it's, as it's about my tribe's better than your tribe, ego's gotten to it. But thankfully, this isn't something that only just special people get to experience once every couple thousand years. This is something that is sitting within us and all around us, waiting for any one of us to reconnect to at any time. I'll leave this episode there. Until next time, I thank you as always, and I hope that peace, love, and grooviness blossoms in your heart. And I hope that if you've been struggling with some fear and you've suddenly come across this episode, that it helps. And if you're not sure where to start, it's quite simple. Just tell your fear that you forgive it. Tell your fear that you love it and that you forgive it. Make that your mantra for a week or 90 days or the craziest level of the challenge as I've formulated it for myself. Nine months. Do nine months of a forgiveness practice. Forgiving who? Everything. Forgiving what? Everyone. Forgiving when? Everywhere. I mean, wasn't that what Jesus came and told us? Plain and simple, at the core of all his teaching was forgive yourself, forgive each other, and love one another as you would love to be loved, because that's what God is. I challenge every person who thinks of themselves as a Christian to reevaluate Christ's words. And if you can get at it, get your hands on an honest academic translation of the oldest versions of the Gospels. I'll read those. Like before King James. Before the councils of Nicaea. Etc. Etc. Alright, for reals. I gotta run. Thanks for tuning in. Peace out. Don't forget to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive your flaws. Forgive your thoughts. Forgive your mind. Forgive your body. Forgive your energy. Forgive your soul. Forgive your family. Forgive your friends. Forgive your enemies. Forgive the people that you hate irrationally just because you chose to hate them. Forgive whoever did the worst things ever done to you. And I know that that is not easy, friends, but that's where the healing is. But don't forget to forgive yourself.